Hoon Lee, welcome to An Act of Despairs. How are you doing, brother? I'm well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Man, I am such a big fan of yours. I had Anthony Starr on recently. <laughs> yep. Uh, and, you know, we were talking about you and, and Banshee's the show I discovered you in and, and I've watched everything you've done since. And now you, you just had Mulan come out, which is yeah, right. amazing. Yeah. And, and you're a big theater actor, which I, I didn't know. I, I love that because I'm a theater guy. And yeah, uh, yeah man, I, I think you're incredible. You know, Thank I, you. I have so many amazing things are coming your way. I know it for sure. And uh, but before we, you know, do that, let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up primarily in the Boston area and um... Plymouth, right? Actually, no. My my parents ended up in Plymouth for a while, but I, I actually grew up in a town called Wayland, Massachusetts, and uh, and then I was in the Boston area for a, a while. Um, wow. Went to school there, and yeah, you went to Harvard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. How was that? Was that always a dream, or uh, for my parents? Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of dreams you take on. You know, yeah. You inherit. Um, did, you, did you go to their theater department because no yeah I, I came to acting in kind of a roundabout way so i actually went i studied visual art and english literature but you're yeah. did i read this correctly your parents are artists right they're scientists actually yeah oh, my okay. whole family my whole family is scientists aside from me wow so talk yeah. to me you know at harvard you know were you seeing any kind of regional theater in in boston because i know <sighs> sometimes they do shows there before they come to broadway you know? I I did not because I I did not think I was ever going to be an actor. I had no designs on it. I it had never occurred to me. Um, I assumed I was going to be a visual artist. I uh, started doing graphic design when I was in college, and this was right when like the first Macintosh computers were starting to come into the into the departments. And so I I never considered it. Uh, I sang in an acapella group there, which was sort of the extent of my stage oh, performance. Singer. Yeah, that's how I actually started. It was a group called the Din and Tonics. And, um, <laughs> that's the one thing I wish I could do. <laughs> everyone could do it. Yeah. Everyone could do it. Everyone should do it. Um, I can talk sing. I can't like, you know. Uh, everyone can do it. <laughs> I appreciate the optimism. It's a sliding scale, man. Yeah. Man. Touche. Touche. Yeah. So uh, then, but yeah, it was, it was so the, it ended up being a, a kind of a, an entree into acting that I wasn't expecting. So, I mean, you were an artist, you were doing graphic design. Mm -hmm. Where did the, where did the pivot and what was the moment that it would kind of, uh, was the catalyst? Uh, so I, I was involved in a couple of startups. Um, I had started a graphic design company with a friend of mine out of college. And um, we were doing that, just sort of building a business. And we ended up working for a technology company uh, that was sort of just transitioning into web consultancy and, uh, they didn't have a design department. So they ended up absorbing us, uh, as part of their company. And we helped design the first, um, New England Patriots, uh, website and e-commerce site. And, I bet uh, that was a sweet check. <laughs> that was, that was, that was a, that was a, that was a lot of learning. A lot of learning happened uh, in that job. Yeah. Um, the NFL, yeah, we were, despite all its evils, I hear it pays well. <laughs> well, you know, we're also a bunch of like what mid twenty nerds, yeah, you know, totally. in a in a room, a meeting room full of like ex football players. It was, you know, I kept expecting to get shoved in a locker. But, you know. <laughs> but uh, we ended up doing that, and then uh, that that process during that whole time as the, that startup was growing, it was uh, it was a really stressful time. And, and uh, where are you right now geographically? When I'm still in the Boston area. Yeah. Oh, okay. Boston so you're area. still yeah, up Cambridge. there. Cambridge. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Yeah. And then uh, a friend of mine who I had done some music with, a composer, he had been writing uh, the music for a musical called Making Tracks, which was going to go on tour in Taiwan. Uh, and I helped him record some demo tracks for that as they were prepping for it. And the producers uh, asked me if I was curious in auditioning because of these demo tracks. And at the time I was, I really needed a break from work. You know, we were, we were really killing ourselves. Um, yeah. you know, a couple of us went to the hospital for work and do stress and we were 25, 26, like yeah. it was nuts. So uh, I ended up auditioning for that show thinking that I would take a leave of absence from work and just reset basically. Are you bi trilingual or? No, 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 no. This was all, this was all in English. Oh, okay. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up doing that show for about three months. Um, 
and I came back and I, I realized I, I didn't think I was going to be an actor at that point, but I realized I couldn't continue sort of harming myself. Yeah. So I, uh, I trained my replacement and then I, I quit and I started gathering my portfolio because I thought I was going to freelance and design again. How and, were your uh, parents handling all of these pivots? Uh, they were fine. I mean, at that point, they, no one thought I was going to act, including myself. So yeah. everyone was sort of like, yeah, take, you know, take a break and get healthy. And, you know, it was all very, just very understood. You know? To provide a little context, like growing up in childhood, mm -hmm. G theater, did you watch a lot of movies? Like I did a couple of high school plays. Okay. That was it. Like, I, I mean, I honestly didn't think anything like it never I, like, I can legitimately measure, say it never crossed my high mind. school and and doing the d dum d dum d dum it just was not <laughs> yeah. it was not something that was going to happen it was already hard enough sort of wrestling with the idea amongst a family of scientists that i was going to go into visual art you know yeah. like that, that was a big enough hurdle um and so i i, I think in hindsight you know it's easy to sort of write the narrative in hindsight but um i do think that it it was helpful for me to come to it late. Uh, sort of in my late twenties is sort of when I actually started to do it. Um, a critical maturity and real life experience. I I got sober at at twenty five. So oh wow! Okay. I you know I I had chances before, but I fucked them all up. And so yeah, I do think there is something about coming to it late that, while for, in often cases it can be harder to get the traction you're a better actor and a better person and more prepared for lack of a better term, all the bullshit that can come with it. I think that uh, there's some value in feeling a bit more comfortable with who you are. And yeah. I think when you're a, when you're young, quite young, um, you haven't, you're not as accurate about it. Some people are, I, I certainly wasn't, but um, I think that you could fall into a trap where you kind of, you see yourself in a certain way, maybe the industry doesn't see you in a certain way, and that dissonance can be quite uh, stressful, right? Like I knew when I was 28 that I was never going to be auditioning for sort of the young ingenue romantic lead. Um, and I, I wasn't particularly interested in that, which was fortunate, but I think if, if I had started sort of auditioning maybe when I was 21, maybe I would have harbored some of that yeah. expectation or hope and uh, that might have that might have led to a lot of uh, bad auditions. That might have led to a lot of early failure. I had a lot of early success because of the kindness of other people, um, who, you know, really said, "I think you should audition for this." The, the choreographer from that Taiwan show, this gentleman named Mark Oka, he he called me after that show was done and I was prepping my portfolio. And he, he said, there's this production of The King and I going up at the Paper Mill Playhouse with uh, the late Kevin Gray and Carolee Carmelo, and I think you should be seen for it. And he got me the audition. Um, Didn't and that I ended up doing Broadway? that show. No, that, one, that was a different one. That was a regional production, oh, which was okay. phenomenal because Carolee and Kevin, you know, they're, they were Broadway vets. And so to have as your second show, you know, being able to understudy Kevin and see how pros did it, you know? Yeah. Um, and they were both incredibly generous. Uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to reunite with Carolee in, at, in Urinetown a couple of years later. But, um, and then while that show was wrapping in the summer, uh, Flower Drum Song was being revived on Broadway. And that same guy, Mark, he said, um, I think you should be seen for this. And he got me an audition. So um, he, was he your pseudo manager? No, he was just a friend that um, benefactor. <laughs> yeah, he just, he yeah. just you know I, I I have him very much in my mind because now as a as an older actor with a little more experience, I I firmly remember how much help I got and and that people didn't have to. They went out of their way to be kind to me, and I I try to. Um, I feel that's a debt I have to pay, in, in a way. So beautiful, you know? paid forward. I love that. Yeah, exactly. Well, to me, it's paying, paying, paying what back. was already paid to me. <laughs> yeah. I'm just paying it back. Um, but I don't think if, I think given that I wasn't uh, particularly driving towards an acting career, I think if I didn't have early success, I don't think I'd be here. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful that I'm here. So um, this wasn't a case. There, there were two things that really happened. One was uh, people were incredibly kind to me. And two, um, in that first year, 
this Taiwan show happened, King and I was going up in New Jersey, and then Flower Drum Song was being revived on Broadway. And the, at that time in particular, the idea of three Asian-themed shows happening in the same year was, was not normal. Um, so just the opportunity being presented was pretty, pretty different. And when you were going up every night, did you feel you know, that beautiful performance bug that we all long for? Did it switch in your brain that like, I love this? Uh, you know, I, I think what I still respond to the most, uh, to be honest, I, uh, stage, and stage is a little different for me than, than film and TV. I, I feel very comfortable on stage. I always have. I don't, I don't know why that is, but I've, I've, it, I'll be incredibly nervous just before going on. Um, and then when I'm actually on, I feel very at ease. I feel very much in my element. Um, film and TV, I don't feel that in quite the same way, but on stage I do. And I, I attribute a lot of that to the audience. Um, there's something, I do feel like there's something to the idea that you are being carried by a group of people, that they are there and they are, you recognize that sort of sense of community and, and that gives you something. Um, but to this day, my favorite aspect of acting is the sort of uh, community aspect of it, the team building aspect of it, uh, being in a company. Um, I think that's, that's a great thing for me. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me at, at, at this time, you know, was it really binary New York or LA? Like about where to go for work? No, because I, you know, I always, I, I, I I've never responded that well to LA. I just never have. Um, yeah. And I, maybe that's just being raised in Boston. Like, <laughs> you're a Northeast guy. I, they disown me, you know. Like, you just have to tell people you're a fan of the Pat, you know, the Pats because otherwise they might hurt you, you yeah. know, that sort of thing. Um, but oh, LA, were you, did you ever wear any like Red Sox stuff out in New York? <laughs> oh, no. You know, like, <laughs> that's one of those things. Like, uh, that was, I had a friend who would do that just deliberately, just troll people constantly. Yeah. Um, but he would do it the other way. He would, he would, troll with uh, wearing New York paraphernalia in Boston. But um, <laughs> I think it's way more dangerous, way bad. more dangerous. I love um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, LA never really had a lot of appeal for me. And uh, being from the East Coast, I think New York was just sort of attractive to me in general, um, because I wanted to experience it. Uh, I wanted to have the experience of being in New York. And, um, and uh, it was fortunate because theater was, I think that was an area where I could really work and learn early and um, it's much harder to do that in LA in the from theater perspective well there um, there is I mean I think other than the Geffen and and yeah. maybe one other in, in Westwood there, there's not much out there you know yeah there's really not I mean yeah. people do I think people really make the effort which I applaud uh, but just the infrastructure for doing small theater and workshops and all these sorts of things in New York is is pretty special and it's something I miss I, I really miss actually so so when you finally got that Broadway you know d is that when you officially moved to New York no I was in New York prior even though I was working for this Boston company I was working remotely from New York wow. um and I had moved there because I was uh just I just wanted to try something different I'd been in Boston for a long time so I was working out of my apartment and just remote, you know, remote conferencing in and doing all my work from there, flying back to Boston a lot, like maybe once or once every two weeks. It's like a 30 a minute week. flight, right? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. It's, yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at that time I wasn't married or anything. So, you know, so yeah, uh, you had all this time. <laughs> time to waste, uh, which I did. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, but you know, when, um, it took me a long time to sort of come to the, come to the idea that I was an actor. I think I'd been working as an actor for maybe five years before I kind of admitted it to myself that I was an actor. Wow. It took and me when, a while. And when you admitted it to yourself, was that like, did you have rep or was that when you're like, I need, I got an agent, uh, after flower drum song. Okay. Um, so I had a Broadway show under my belt at that point. Um, because of the efforts of, of kind strangers, <laughs> kind friends. Yeah. And uh, so then I did get an agent and I started, you know, trying more in earnest. Um, but again, with this sort of, I just kind of always expected it to be to like, kind of like, I'm just felt like I was like watching a souffle that was about to deflate at any minute, like at any moment, just, yeah. it was all going to go away. And then I'd be like, okay, well, that was fun. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Now I can try to pay rent. It's um, everything. Beer. Yeah, um, but but it, it's 
I've been very fortunate in how things have progressed. And um, after a while, the real decision came because I realized I was not going to get better as either a designer or an actor until I committed. Like I just wasn't going to improve. I wasn't going to grow. You were so design work for side cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, I, and also because I, I loved it. And to this day, I, I do miss that world. Oh, no, no. I mean, oh, I just, okay. I miss that world. I, yeah. I, you know, I still feel very attached to it. Um, and uh, it was, um, you know, it was, a, it was a, actually a harder decision than people might think. Yeah, I can imagine. And how did you come to meet someone who's near and dear to both of our hearts, Donna? Oh, Donna. So I was doing a show uh, in LA. I was doing a show at the Mark Taper called <laughs> Yellow Face. Uh, Yellow Face at the Mark Taper with uh, uh, David Henry Huang's play, yeah. um, uh, directed by Lee Silverman. And uh, she had a client in that show, Peter Scannavino, who you know. Ah, love Peter. Yeah, yeah love he's the best. Love um, Peter. <laughs> Peter and I were uh, the co-leads of that show. And um, we just, I, we got on very, very well. And uh, so he introduced me to Donna, and uh, Donna at the time was uh, not incredibly experienced. She had been transitioning uh, from her career as well, and uh, I just really got on with her. I thought her enthusiasm was fantastic, and you know, one thing about the industry and the business in general, although I think this is more universal, is that you, you can learn skills. You can, you know, you can learn things but it's very hard to teach faith, you know? <laughs> like, and the fact that she, um, she clearly believed in me and believed that I could do anything. And that wasn't something I had really seen sort of universally. Yeah. That was something that uh, we're in an industry where you're typed out a lot and people don't, are, they're not actually incentivized to give you time, yeah. right? They're incentivized to make things as quick and as efficient as possible. So they'll reach for what's easiest. Um, this person can do this thing, we know, so we'll grab that. Um, but I knew Donna thought I could do anything. And so I was like, well, everything else I think can be learned, but I, I can't teach that. And after, you know, getting an agent, then meeting Donna and having done all these amazing theater projects, was that when they were like, hey man, what do you, what do you feel about film and TV? Or were you no, I mean, we were always trying to do that, but um, you know, it's, it's, I remember having conversations with my father where, you know, and God bless him, you know, he doesn't have any experience in this world, but, you know, he would try to offer me support in the way that he, he can, which is often unsolicited advice. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's like the big, you know, that's a parental thing. And I find myself doing that with my son now. Cool. Um, but uh, he would say things like, you know, what you got to do is you got to do some more film and TV. And we we're like, yeah, that's what everyone's trying to do. Yeah, there's three points. I was like, oh, I'm, oh, yeah, right. That's, I should have thought of that. Um, and so you, you're just kind of making those efforts. But um, I don't think I realized at the time how different those disciplines are. And that because of the common, uh, because of the sort of, common area where they intersect which is like acting for example yeah. like the fact that they use actors it's you you kind of think that there's a lot of similarity but they to my mind at least are quite different which is yeah. why i think you don't see as much intuitive crossover as you you would imagine well it's a lot of sitting and waiting you know like with the with an audience and and do yeah. theater, you get that immediate reaction mm -hmm. you're like okay cool I, I i got that part the way i wanted to Whereas like, you know, with, with these things, it can take three months to three years for something to come out and you have no control over it. And all you can do is put in the work and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think, um, you know, and intuitively it kind of makes sense if you look at any other activity or discipline, like you would never expect someone who's like a world-class runner at the hundred yard dash to be a world-class marathon athlete, yeah. right? Even though they're both runners, right? It, yeah. And, and, or similarly, like anyone who draws, they might be anything from an architect to a fine art painter. Yeah. Um, but you know, they're radically different things. And uh, for some reason, I think partially because people don't know too much about acting in general, um, because people are 
especially when they're young, they're not encouraged to act, which I think is a shame. Um, because of that, people don't have a great idea of what, what it actually entails. And the fact that you're, you're using one discipline, one sliver of a discipline to create radically different products and the products being like a stage show versus uh, a film, you know? Um, As so. you started to get more and more, you know, guest stars up to reoccurring, did you start to feel more comfortable in that medium? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really just a learning process, and there's no real substitution for you know time. You know, uh, uh, the only thing you can do to help, like if if I think if I were to be able to go back in time and sort of talk to myself, the one thing I would say is like really pay attention. Pay attention to what everyone is doing, not just what you're doing. Um, and I don't mean fellow actors. That that was pretty intuitive that you had to kind of be in communication with what's happening with your fellow actors. But I mean, what are, what is the director of photography doing? What is, what is the director doing? What are the, what is the script supervisor doing? Like, how does this machine work? Yeah. Because I think then you get a better sense of how to play your role better. Not just um, people, I think, younger actors in particular i sound very old manny by the way don't i no, i sound no, very no, get off my no, lawn man. <laughs> like screaming at class. i could listen to you talk for hours uh you know the um like i think a younger actor sometimes thinks they're being hired to come in and produce something and you know and, and leave and that's true but they're also being hired as an employee in a company yeah. and if you were to just apply to any job um, your success in that job is also predicated on your ability to be a useful and good employee, yeah. not just an expert in your field. Totally. Right. And I think that that's not given enough attention because being somebody that people want to work with is part of what allows you to gain access over time and learn more deeply and also have more voice because people want to listen to you. Yeah. Um, and so I knew from working in companies what it was re what was required to work well in teams yeah. and coming into acting and feeling quite insecure in my lack of training. My only thought was, uh, you know, I can't go back in time and try to apply to an acting program. Yeah. What I can do is try to find uh, whatever has whatever I think is salient to work, period, work and apply that to acting in the same way I applied it in other professions and um, try to make up the difference as quickly as possible, basically. Um, I'm curious, so. you know, for the actors listening that are in that co-star guest star circuit, mm -hmm. as an actor who's done that yourself, but is now up to, you know, reoccurring in principle, what do you think makes for A, a good co-star guest star audition and B, to, you know, exist with little lines on set and, and not, you know, I think some actors get on there and then they're panic and, you know, it's like more water, more, more, more water, more, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't go away. Yeah. The amount of, the amount of time I spent trying to figure out how much to pour in a shot glass. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, I'm always in these shows too, where we're constantly drinking. We're constantly at bars and drinking. Yeah, and so Banshee, like, you're in a bar every episode. Banshee warrior. Yeah, and I'm always a character that that is drinking too. It's yeah. not, not just someone who shows up at the place. I'm I'm half drunk all the time. So, the uh, I would say there's two there's two things here to speak towards. One is sort of doing your job or how you do that, and the other part of it is sort of keeping a, a useful amount of perspective um, at whatever phase you're in. So in the audition phase, how do you sort of keep a healthy sense of perspective? In the job phase, how do you keep a healthy perspective? In the you know aftermath of the job, how do you keep a healthy perspective? And these things I think are slightly different, um, but they all are predicated on the same idea for me, which is understand that there's a large number of variables that you have no control over and you have to think Peter very carefully. Sorry. P Peter said the same thing. He was like, look, man, I I've been in those, like watch the law and order tapes and the people that I think should get it never do. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. so random. Yeah. 
And, you know, the, uh, and, and I think you just have to, as much as you're able, because I don't think anyone can do it 100% of the time, um, you just try as much as you're able to not expend wasteful energy on that, you know, because there's other stuff you can be thinking about. And so when I talked to, um, when I kind of broke it down for myself, but also when I spoke to more experienced actors and, and really thought about it, you kind of go, if you look at what an audition is, it's you coming into uh, a situation that's almost 100% opaque to you, right? You often don't know the script. You often don't know uh, the people at all. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know what they're looking for. You don't know what the other actors are like. You don't know what set life is like for that show. You know nothing, right? So what do you have? And what you have is an idea of what you would like to do. That's it. Right. And I think that's as valid as anything else. Right. But the idea that, uh, that somehow I'm going to walk into a scenario where I have zero information and magically light upon the right answer and then chameleonically shape myself. <laughs> to, I mean, it's incredibly, um, it's, it's a arrogant and B, um, it's, it's incredibly unlikely, you know, it's just not, so I, I don't think it's a good use of time, you know, well, it's better to look at it and say, uh, and this is part of a larger conversation, but it's better to look at it and say, like, in the practice of acting, one of the things that's hard to come by is an audience, and that's an integral part to theater and acting. So this is, this is, a, this is an opportunity to have an audience. Yeah. So it's a good bit of practice with an audience, and uh, you should look at it such for me. Yeah. Um, not everyone's going to see it that way. That's totally fine. And there are some people that are just masters at auditioning. Yeah. Like they're just amazing. Yeah, I, I know those some people that can't deliver that same product on set. You know what I mean? Right, right, yeah. right. Or and I, I, yeah. and, they and almost all of us are in between, right? Yeah. That's totally. You have a good one, you have a bad one. But I think that there's something to the idea that um, you can understand that an audition is kind of a special environment. Um, and not one that's, that comes along all that much, but one that's very useful. And, uh, so I like auditioning myself personally. Um, yeah. and a lot of people don't, but I, I, and I actually, I don't really like putting myself on tape because you don't really get that. Yeah, I would, I would rather be in the room. Do yeah. you think we're ever going to go back to in the room? Sure. You sure. do? <laughs> yeah. I hope so. I miss that so much. I mean, we, it's, everything is so immediate right now. But I think that um, if any one of us were really, you know, were to really think about what our lives were like two or three years ago, we'd had we had no idea what life would be like now, right? So why do we think we know what two years from now is going to look like now? That is the best answer I have ever heard. I'm stealing that, <laughs> and I'm going to quote you every time on that. <laughs> but uh. Well, talk, Banshee was like that. Banshee yeah, was like talk that. Talk to me about Banshee, you know, and how did that come your way and what you did with that character? I said this to Anthony and I, I mean every word of it is like the difference between good acting and great acting is like good actors are, are personalities. You could just make a living doing that. And great actors are no other actor could have played that role on earth. And I firmly believe that with you, Trieste, Tom Pelton. Oh, man. I, I think that's I, I that's very kind. I I don't personally hold that opinion, um, I and I think that uh, if I'm honest, I think that one of the things I love about particularly theater is I love the idea that theater is a historically iterative process, right? Like the idea that if you do Hamlet, you are joining a company of people who have done Hamlet, and that it's been passed down for hundreds of years is to me is a, is a is a beautiful thing. Um, but that's predicated on the idea that uh, that the sort of the actor is a vessel for the role, right? And I think that that is I think that's wonderful. I think that that the idea of it of an actor sort of being lionized for being a wholly unique quantity isn't something that's unique to being an actor. That's unique to being a human being, right? So if you love someone in a role, that's great. And there's a lot to be said for leaving that alone. Right? Like, I don't want to see a reboot and remake of everything. Oh, no, no, no. Um, 
But I also think there's something great about saying this role is a role that speaks to universal themes. And so the idea that it is uh, iterated upon in a different historical context with different cultural norms is important because it allows us to start to track uh, how we changed, you know? Yeah. And especially now that we can record things, we can compare and contrast them, you know? And, and for the audience listening, just to paint the landscape, you know, this was like about 2014, is it? When Banshee's first season Yeah, is that right? No, earlier than that, I think 2012-ish or 13. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Cinemax was for a period doing really amazing original <laughs> content. They had your guy's show. They had, uh, what is that other awesome one? The Nick, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talk to me about the character that you got and, and the pitch and the audition process because like it's down a <laughs> also like you know forgive me I, I i don't know how to classify it with the correct pc terms no 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 that's yeah actually that was uh it's interesting because um so i was doing i was at yale doing winter's tale and uh i got this casual <laughs> i mean it was it was really fun um uh with lupita nyong'o actually oh wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I keep joking like, you know, I haven't seen her since and I keep joking one day I'll be like, hey, remember Yale? No? Okay, cool. Um, nope, you're going to take over for that Star Wars guy. I get <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I got this call to do this audition for this show and uh, we were in rehearsals. So it meant that I had to take the train from New Haven to New York to do the first audition on the day yeah. so that I could come back for rehearsals. Oh, which the is break the screen test then. No, this was just the first round. Oh, first okay, round. okay. Yeah, and uh, the the breakdown, I believe, said something to the effect of, um, we see a beautiful Asian woman, we don't realize it's a man until she speaks. Something like that. Wow. And um, I remember talking to my agent at the time and saying, they know what I look like, right? <laughs> 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 because I knew a lot of... I know a lot of Asian guys that make beautiful Asian women and I am not one of them. So I was like, ah, uh, you're beautiful, man. Well, thank you. But you know, at the time, you know, I, at the time I was about 35 pounds heavier. Um, that was a very different body type and I had never been asked to audition for anything like this. And did you and, have stunt experience? I'm sorry? Stunt experience? Like had, had you? No. A no, no. So, uh, I went into the audition assuming I wasn't going to get it. And it was the, um, for those that know the show, it was the scene where Joe takes on some, some guys in a diner. Oh, um, yeah. Kicks their ass. And uh, all I remember thinking about that scene is like, I don't have a good read on what they're looking for from somebody who's gender fluid like Job is. And the description was somewhat uh, a, a little all over the place. Um, yeah. I didn't know much about that world or the community, but I knew enough to know that there was some specificity to the terms. And you had to uh, make choices. Yeah, and I had to make choices. But yeah. the choice I made was that um, I, the one thing I knew I could tap into is that Job was furious. <laughs> <laughs> In this scene, Job was angry. And I was like, that I can do. Um, so I focused on that. Uh, I focused on the part I thought I could do. And then I didn't, I, I did what I thought was sort of authentic to me in terms of trying to portray character. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be working with Francis Jew at the time in this production of Winter's Tale. And Francis had done M. Butterfly. And so I asked him sort of how he prepared for playing this, this uh, man who, who uh, is a transvestite who cross-dresses in this show and presents as a woman. And he had wonderful insight about it. And so uh, that really helped me about trying to get into a mindset. Um, but I did the audition and then I was like, I wrote it off and Boom, then right. a couple, yeah, I just was like, yeah. whatever, went back, went back to rehearsal. Then they called me back a couple of days later and they said, they want to see you again. And I was like, they do. <laughs> All right. So I went in and I was kind of, I did the same thing. It was the same trip. And this time I think Greg Tanis was there. Uh, and, and again, I was like, okay, so I did something right. So I, I just did the call back. And then a couple days later, they called me and they said they want to fly you out to LA for a screen test. And now I'm nervous because now I'm like, oh, this is for real. real yeah. um, and I'm trying to work out my schedule and how that might work with the show. But then they called me back and they said they don't need the screen test. They're going to go to offer. And uh, 
So you didn't even I, have to go to L.A.? No. Oh, wow. That would have been a bummer if you went there. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's your role. What the fuck, man? <laughs> I think, I mean, actually, that would have been fine. It's if yeah. they, we went there and then they said no, yeah. then it would be a bummer. Um, but at that point, uh, so I knew then I was going to close the show when we ended our run. And then a few weeks later, I was going to go to Charlotte and I was committed for six years. And that was kind of the, that's been the most sort of uh, clear demonstration of that phenomenon I've just, I've just talked about, which is if you had asked me even a week prior what my life was going to look like over the next five years, I would have been 100% inaccurate, 100%. And Banshee led to other things. And so my, uh, the disparity in my perception or projection versus reality would, have, would grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so that's why in some ways I kind of look at the situation we're in now and I go, uh, the way that we're thinking about COVID um, and the pandemic, it's important to take it seriously. It's important to be cautious. It's important to be safe with each other. And there's been a tremendous loss of life. But the idea that we uh, aren't going to figure our way through it somehow, to me, um, is needlessly um, despairing. You know, yeah, because very well. Yeah, the podcast we, title. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, we don't we don't know what six months from now is going to look like. Banshee ended up being four seasons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talk to me about you know having a show that's just so action intensive and acting intensive. Was that was that hard for uh, you to balance both at the same time? I it was awesome. I mean, I I can't tell you how lucky I've been in the work and. By which I mean, um, I think there are some actors that would look at a show like that that's, that's you know, over the top, it's hyper real, it's pulpy, and they might go, well, this isn't the sort of work I want to do, right? Killed and, uh, sorry? I, I would have killed to have done Banshee. Well, you know? no, I'm, I'm, I, I have no complaints about it. Um, but <laughs> I, I tend to measure the quality of a job for me based on how much I feel I can learn. And so the amount of learning on Banshee was just astronomical. I was doing stunts. I hadn't done stunts before. I was cross gesturing. I'd never explored that before. I was working in television. It was my first series regular role. Um, I was also learning at the time with Jonathan Tropper, who in, it was his first television thing too. And so we kind of, in some ways, you know, I've worked with him three times now. And uh, it, we were kind of coming up together, which was really nice because I felt like I was able to talk to him in a way that maybe someone more experienced wouldn't have allowed um, or wouldn't have invited. Um, you know, and you're working with incredible people uh, in the cast who I really admired, um, but it was incredibly hard to make. It was, it was a tough show to make. Um, the stunt stuff was of particular interest to me. And I, I really credit Marcus Young and his team there uh, with in many ways and, and the trainers we used for that too. Um, Did you try to do most of your own when you could? Yeah, you know, they, yeah. the way that they tend to shoot the show, our faces are almost always exposed. Yeah. So if we can do it, we, we try to do it. Um, and I, you know, I'm, Job's stunt work was relatively limited. Someone like Ant, who's, I mean, the workload on him was incredible. Um, oh yeah, and, and you know, he was injured often. And, uh, you know, best guy, he's been so nice to me. Yeah. He's a, he's, he's a phenomenal actor too. And yeah. just, he's I'm glad that he's, uh, he's playing roles where he can really show some of the special things he can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, because I think he, in, in Banshee, um, and he probably talked about this, but like, you know, in Banshee, Banshee could have been a very different show. Yeah. Um, and I think he fought really hard to, um, give Lucas hood as much soul as possible. Yeah, beautiful human, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Trying, and that makes it very fun for anyone working in the scene with him to try to match that, to try to, like, complement it. Um, yeah, so that was, that was a, it's a, for, for, especially from a creative standpoint, to feel like your lead is sort of leading that charge to, to, to dig for more. Well, and also, it, Banshee was just so ahead of its time in representation, you know, both, yeah, you know, I mean, I think that one of the nice things we had, we've had, we had a lot of conversations about Job, and I had a lot of apprehension about 
playing a character who I think people would, there was a lot of traps with him basically, um, that he would be seen as representative of a community that I didn't personally identify with, that yeah. he would be seen as cartoonish, that he would be seen as um, uh, played for laughs, yeah, played no. as the butt of jokes. And the only thing, so we were, you know, the creative team was incredibly sensitive to that and to the fact that I was, you know, that I was concerned about it. Um, and where we basically landed was to say, whatever we do with Joe, we have to be able to defend that choice from a character perspective, meaning we don't need to know why a group of people does something. We need to know why Joe does something. Yeah. And if I can say that with 100% confidence, that's the best I can do. I can't control other people's opinions that's about what they're seeing. It was um, so amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, stamina-wise, to carry a, a personality that magnetic and kinetic, was it, were you exhausted after every day of filming? Um, I mean, filming's tiring, but I mean, my schedule was not super bad, you know, it was fine. Wow. And, um, and more importantly, you know, I, you want to work hard, I think. I mean, I, th I think most people that, that I respect want to work hard and, and find value in that, in, in doing so. But uh, I, never, I never saw Job as a burden. I always saw Job as an incredible gift and, and kind of tried to, I, I had two objectives. One was to just remember that I might never get a role like that again. And then two, to leave the show without uh, any regret about my effort. Yeah. Um, I never felt like I really cracked Job 100%. Every year I would come back and be like, this is the year. Yeah, this is the year. You're amazing. Um, We're all oh, only... thank you. But uh, yeah. you know that, but that internal sort of. You yeah, know, of um, course. I know that I, the voice well. It's in my head all the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then but I did, I did, I was able to leave every season going, that's the most I could do this season. Amazing. And yeah. uh, just for time's sake, you know, because sure. I, I, I don't want to ignore this amazing film that you have out in Milan, mm. which was an animated film. And then now the global behemoth that has become Disney yeah, yeah. You know, did a live action version. Moreover, you know, since Banshee started 2020, you know, the representation scale has gotten a lot better as, mm. as an Asian American. Did you feel like we're headed in a good direction? Well, you know, like the show that's airing on Cinemax now, Warrior, is uh, a largely Asian cast, which is very unique. Um, I don't know if you've been able to catch it yet, but I, I haven't. No. I'm... Well, if, if you like Banshee, you'll like the show. <laughs> First thing I'm doing when I get um, but uh, you know, we're dealing with a group of. We're it's it's set in San Francisco Chinatown at the end of the 19th century, uh, which was an incredibly fraught historical time period, um, and it centers around the Tong Wars, the Chinese Gang Wars of the time, and it's a it's a heightened version of this. It's like um, a bit of historical pastiche, but it's also, but it's also you know, it is pulpy. Um, and, but it is drawing from a real time in history with real challenges in history. And uh, in researching that time period, I, I, I think people would be surprised that some of the things that are sort of used as the inspiration for events in Warrior um, happened in real life. I think people would assume that some of the more outlandish things are made up. In fact, some of the more outlandish things are from fact. I, I know uh, a lot of people felt that way about Watchmen opening with that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah. Oh my exactly. God. Exactly. That was real, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you look at things like that and projects like Warrior, uh, which is just such a joy. Um, and you, it does certainly give you the impression and the hope that representation is becoming broader and more diverse. Yeah. But having been around for a while, I've heard that before, you know? I heard it when Joy Luck Club came out. I heard it when All American Girl came out. I heard it when Miss Saigon came out. I heard it when um, Crazy Rich Asians came out. Yeah. And it's not that it doesn't get better, but I think that the idea of some sort of magical flashpoint where things will, ma will suddenly transform, I think is a myth. And it's not really, 
in our best interest to wait around for that. It's in our best interest to push as hard as we can with as much persistent effort as we can to diversify the kinds of stories that are told. It's um, you know, yeah. have the landscape be authentic to, to the real world. You know, it's not, it's not white, it's not black, it's, it's, a, it's all colors and yeah. all varieties. And, and that's what's so beautiful about it. But talk to me about getting on like a two, $300 million movie set. What, <laughs> what was that experience like? Well, part, I mean, I'm in that movie for like two minutes, if that. But, ah, uh, that's a long two minutes. <laughs> uh, but I, I knew I was going to be in the trailer, though, because basically my character lays out the plot. Um, but the, the thing I was most curious about was how different would a big movie feel from the television work I'd done? Yeah. Um, and would it feel radically different? And... And thankfully, the answer was not not really. It, not even it, on a Disney two hundred fifty million dollar budget. I mean, what you where I saw the biggest difference is that you take everything you do in a TV show and you just blow it way up, right? So something that you it's know, not a greater <laughs> scale. Yeah, like if you're yeah. trying to put a costume together on a small TV show, you're like, look, you're like, how how much costume can I get for ten dollars? <laughs> yeah, I gotta go to the Halloween store. <laughs> if you're if you're in a Disney show, you're like, we're gonna have this harness custom made by a master leather craftsman, so you can show up on stage for thirty seconds, you know, like that sort of thing. Um, so the scale is radically different, but the the processes didn't feel that different. Yeah. Um, and so I think uh, that was really good to see for me because. Um, I have much less film experience and TV experience, but it's an area where I, thus, I, I know it's an area where I have a lot to learn and that makes it a sort of place that I'm curious about. Um, Amazing. But I do love television. I love, I oh, love too. the it's idea of working. Yeah. The long narrative, yeah. David Simon, you know, what, what, what you can do with that is incredible. But final three questions for you, brother. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I love your optimism about COVID. Uh, you know, for, for all the actors out there that are the young hoons who <laughs> maybe are making the switch from graphic design or, or you <laughs> right. know, whatever, mm -hmm. waiting table yeah. for bartending into acting. Yeah. And any words of wisdom you would have for them? <sighs> any words of wisdom? Gosh. I heard this once and it made a big impression on me, but it's, I'm going to paraphrase it because uh, I'm going to remember it inaccurately, but there's a lot of things in the world that are going to tell you that what you choose to do, particularly acting or life in the arts is not that important, yeah. that it's extra, that it's something that people should attend to once the more important issues are settled. Yeah. And that's an absolute lie. And um, in my mind, the arts are the actual practice of our humanity. Yeah. And thus, it should take precedence over quite a few things. Um, so don't, like the world needs you. You know, the world needs what we do. And... Um, it may not need a particular movie. It may not need a particular TV show, but uh, don't stop because you think it's unimportant or because someone tells you it's unimportant. Yeah. Stop if you don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. But don't stop because you think it's trivial because it's not. Yeah. You know, it's one of the most important things someone can do. I couldn't agree more. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Next question is, is what's keeping you inspired right now? Um, so this is going to sound like a weird answer, but um, because of, because Banshee cut across a fairly dynamic dem uh, demographic of people, particularly yeah. in the U S it's put me in contact through social media with a number of uh, people who are, you know, politically on the other end of the spectrum from me. So for example, a lot of people who support Trump, yeah, I'm a Biden Harris. Yeah, <laughs> as, as am I. Yeah. Um, uh, but I've ended up speaking with a number of them um, offline, too. And I did that mostly because I felt like I was um, starting to see people with different political views as somewhat faceless yeah. 
and l sort of less real. Yeah. And in speaking to people about it, in about subjects where we're at 180 degrees apart from each other, um, it's been good to sort of remember that there are people on the other ends of these voices and that I don't understand their context. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know what difficulties they've struggled with in their lives. But the, the realization of that um, through the communication is in my mind, why we do theater. It's why we do drama. It's to engage in hard to talk about conversation. Well, also to practice being in the perspective of someone else, right? Mm -hmm. Like as an actor, our job is to sort of inhabit someone else or let someone else inhabit us. And not judge them. Right, yeah. And so to do that in real life in some limited capacity with people I strongly disagree with, I've found to be a good, um, something that feeds the idea uh, or feeds uh, my fuel for doing what I do, because I think it's important. I think it's important for people to practice it and for it to be okay for people to practice it, you know? Oh man, you're gonna make me cry. You're crushing it. <laughs> last, last question, brother. This one is is a, is a fun one. Is what's next for you, project wise, acting wise? Uh, I'm working on a project right now in Toronto. Um, and uh, about um, it. Sorry. Can you say much about it or no? I, I don't actually know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna default to no. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, and uh, this has been good, and it's been. Uh, Toronto's, I've never stayed in Toronto. It's been good getting to know the city. Um, but honestly, like, uh, this is sort of what I'm focusing on. It's gotten me, you know, I've got a sort of committed amount of time on, on, I'm on this or something next year, which I really can't talk about, unfortunately, which is also exciting. But, um, but in the meantime, Only I, for Star Wars, starting the campaign from your lips, I mean, <laughs> My God, I'll call George Lucas. I, I could call it at that point. I could just be like, "I'm out of here." Um, <laughs> but I think, uh, honestly, like everyone else, I'm I'm much more sort of focused on sort of trying to make sense of what's happening in our world, yeah. and 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 uh, that's enough. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> Lonely man, I really needed this myself. So oh, I'm glad. Day and I got so much love and admiration for you. Let's Thank you. connect when you get back to New York and grab that. Yeah. You, me, and Donna, we'll have dinner or something. That'd be great, yeah. And uh, I'd love to have you back when, when that project that you're shooting now comes out. That'd be great, yeah. I'd love that. From the bottom of my heart, brother, thank you for thank coming you. Back. back. It means the world. Thank you. Stay safe. So much love, okay? Talk All soon. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. I am thrilled to announce that An Actor Despairs is partnering with a wonderful CBD company called Kind Farms. Everyone out there has heard of CBD. I started taking it a few years ago when I first started getting sober and to help with my anxiety. Sadly, as one can do, I was overtraining in the gym and a friend recommended a topical and a tincture to help with the pain. I tried it. It was okay. However, recently, I was introduced to a product that has really changed my life. Not only has it helped me with anxiety, but I am stronger than I have ever been. I'm able to carry out lifts my body used to prevent me from doing. Kind Farm products have single-handedly changed my life athletically and personally. They utilize 100% local licensed farmers, organic cultivation, and CO2 extraction for superior CBD. Kind Farms is turning CBD to a kind alternative to pharmaceuticals. Let's transform tobacco row into hemp row. If you want to get involved, please reach out. Together, we can make a difference. You can use my code RYAN10 for 10% off. You can find them on Instagram at Kind Farms Inc., all one word. That's K I N D P H A R M S I N C. And their website is kindfarmsinc.com. Once again, my code for 10% off is Ryan10.